This is a description of a simple lottery game, and we're going to figure out how many tickets we would need to buy to guarantee that we win the jackpot. To answer this question, we'll need to establish an important result about counting multisets. We will solve this particular instance of the problem, but then we'll also use a common combinatorial proof technique to establish the relevant identity in the general case. Let's read through it. Consider a lottery game where five numbers are drawn from the set of natural numbers from 1 through 100. That's what those square brackets mean. With each number replaced, immediately after being selected, so each number that is drawn could immediately be drawn again right after. To win the jackpot, one must play the same multi-set of numbers as the one drawn. The fact that it's a set means that the order of the numbers don't matter. Your combination of numbers simply must match the combination of the five numbers that are drawn. And the fact that it's a multi-set again means that any number could appear multiple times in the combination. For example, 11122 is a possibility. The question then, of course, is how many lottery tickets must one buy to make sure he wins the jackpot. Since the winning lottery ticket could be any of the five number combinations from this set where we permit repetition, we need to count how many such combinations there are. If, for example, there were only 10 possible tickets and we buy 10 tickets, then we're guaranteed to win the jackpot because one of those tickets has to be the winning one. Now, there is a simpler concept which is almost sufficient for this counting problem. Again, the set we're interested in is this set of natural numbers from 1 through 100. So it looks something like that. And it's easy to calculate the number of ways we can select five numbers from this set. We write that like this. It's called a binomial coefficient and is read as 100 choose 5. It's the number of ways we could choose 5 numbers from this collection of 100 numbers. The way this is calculated is 100 factorial divided by 5 factorial multiplied by 100 minus 5 factorial, so 95 factorial. And this happens to equal 75 million. 287,000 520. The problem, of course, is that this doesn't actually count all the possibilities that are relevant to our situation. This is just counting the combinations of five numbers from this set. It is not permitting repetition, which is permitted for the lottery game. So how do we adjust our counting strategy to account for the fact that repetition of a number is allowed? Well, what we're going to do is connect the combinations that we're trying to count to combinations that we already know how to count. It's a pretty clever technique, and here's how it works. We know that any set of five numbers that we might have on a lottery ticket, this must be true about them. One is less than or equal to the smallest number in the combination, let's call it A1, which is less than or equal to the second smallest number in the combination, let's call that A2, and so on. All the way up until the fifth number, A5, which is less less than or equal to 100 because of course we are drawing numbers from the set from 1 through 100. The important details here are that there are five numbers. Every lottery ticket will have five numbers. The minimum possibility for each number is 1. The maximum possibility is 100. And the inequalities are all less than or equal to because for any five numbers we could certainly put them in an order like this and they are permitted to repeat so it's possible that two or three or four or all five could be equal. It's precisely the fact that any of these numbers could be equal that makes the counting difficult. So what we're going to consider is a function which takes these five numbers on our lottery ticket and maps them to five other numbers that are distinct. And here's how the function works. If we take this five tuple, a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, note that the order doesn't matter for the lottery game, but we have put the five numbers in order because it's convenient to do so. If we put them in the function f, f will map them to this set of five elements. This set is not a multi-set because all of the elements are guaranteed to be distinct. They are a1, a2 plus 1, a3 plus 2, and so on. Now, how do we know these numbers are all distinct? 
Well, if any of them were distinct before, for example, if a3 was not equal to a4, well, certainly a3 plus 2 is not equal to a4 plus 3, because we've added distinct things to distinct things, so we end up with distinct things. On the other hand, if any of the numbers were equal, say a1 and a2 were equal, well, now a1 and a2 plus 1 are definitely distinct, because again, we've added distinct things things, in this case, to equal things. So again, this is the image of our function. We put a five tuple representing a possible five number combination for a lottery ticket into the function, and it gives us this set of five elements. Now, where does this set, the output of the function, live? Well, it's a subset of the set that contains all positive integers from one through 104. So it's a subset set of this set. That's because the smallest number we could have on the lottery ticket is 1, and after getting put through the function, it would still be 1. The biggest number we could have on the lottery ticket is 100, and after getting put through the function, it could be as big as 104. So this set is a subset of, which is what that symbol means, it's a subset of the set of natural numbers from 1 through 104. Now it's critical we see the two-way connection here. From any five-number combination that comes from a lottery ticket, we could get one of the subsets of this set. Conversely, given any five number subset of this set from one through 104, given any five number subset, we could turn that into a possible five number combination for a lottery ticket. For any five number subset, we would just take the biggest number and subtract four, take the second biggest and subtract three, take the third biggest and subtract two, and so on. In the end, we would end up with a valid five number combination for one of the possible lottery tickets. This means that counting the number of possible lottery tickets is the exact same as counting the number of five number subsets of the set of natural numbers from 1 through 104, and we know how to count subsets of a fixed size. The number of five element subsets of the set of natural numbers from 1 through 104 is just 104 choose 5. It's the number of ways we can pick five numbers from a collection of 104 of them. And this happens to be 91,962,500. 520. So in this case, we only need to buy about 92 million lottery tickets and we'll be guaranteed a win. If we suppose that the jackpot pays out $50 million, then we see for the small price of 92 million, you can lose 40 million. So pretty cool lottery. Now, it's important that we connect this to the general identity at play here. You may notice that 104 choose 5 looks a lot like 100 plus 5 minus 1 choose 5, and in fact, this accurately mirrors the appearance of the relevant identity. Indeed, this is the theorem that we've just seen a particular instance of. The number of k element multisets, whose elements all belong to the set of natural numbers from 1 through n, is n plus k minus 1 choose k. Just like what we saw here with 100 plus 5 minus 1, choose 5. In our case, 100 was n and 5 was k. Although our argument was only relevant to our particular case, you could probably easily convince yourself how it applies in general. But let's finish by going through a quick proof of this identity in general. Our proof will begin with something that may seem completely irrelevant, which is the number of non-negative integer solutions to this equation, a1 plus a2 all the way up to plus a n is equal to k. So notice both of the relevant numbers from the theorem are already introduced here. We have n, that's the number of non-negative integers on the left side of the equation, and we have k, that's what the sum 
of the n non-negative integers is equal to. So how many non-negative integer solutions are there to this equation? Well, they're quite easy to count using a cute combinatorial proof method called stars and bars. The idea is first, I'm going to sketch out k stars. Now, of course, we don't know exactly what k is, so this is a sort of general sketch, just a big line of stars. So here are my stars. In total, there are a bunch of them, exactly k to be specific. Then the funny thing is, we can specify the values of a1, a2, and so on, all the way through a n simply by placing sufficiently many bars between these stars. For example, if I place a bar right here, then this tells me that A1 is equal to two. If I place a bar right here, then we see that A2 is equal to one. If we had a bar here and a bar here, that would tell us that we don't know what A this is, but let's say it's AI is equal to four. We could place two bars directly next to each other to set one of the A's equal to zero and so on. By placing these bars, we're able to cut the number K into N non-negative integer pieces thus specifying a solution completely. It's important to note that eventually we would place our last bar, which would specify a n minus one, and consequently it would also specify a n. So how many bars did we have to place? Well, because the last bar specifies two numbers, we don't need to place n bars, we need to place n minus one bars. So we should view this as a big long sequence and it has to consist of k plus n minus one things. It consists of k stars and n minus one bars. And so the number of non-negative integer solutions to this equation is simply the number of ways we can choose to place the n minus one bars in this big long sequence of stars and bars. And so the solution is n plus k minus one, that's the length of the sequence, choose n minus one, which is the number of bars we need to pick positions for. Of course, we could just as well choose where to place the stars instead of the bars. That would give us the same number. So this is equal to n plus k minus one, choose k. Then to connect this to our theorem, we only need to note, just as we did in the previous situation, how there is a two-way connection between non-negative integer solutions of this equation and counting the k element multisets of the set of natural numbers from one through n. We simply regard each ai as telling us how many times i occurs in the multiset. For example, if a1 was four, that would tell us the multiset contains four copies of one. Since all of the ai's add up to k, we're guaranteed to have a k element multiset. And since the indices go from one to n, we'll be specifying how many times every positive integer occurs in the multiset for integers from one through n. One way we could notate this multiset is like this with multiplicative notation, a1 times one. This tells us that our multiset will contain a1 copies of one. It could be zero copies of one, so it's not actually in the multiset. It could be five copies of one. It could be all sorts of possibilities. We would then have a two copies of two and a three copies of three and so on all the way up to a n copies of n. So if we have a solution to this equation, then these numbers will correspond precisely to a k element multiset of the set of natural numbers from one through n. Conversely, if we have a k element multiset of the natural numbers from one through n, we could translate that into a non-negative integer solution of this equation. We would just have to look at the multiset and for example, if it had six copies of one, then to build our solution, we would say that A1 is six. If it had four copies of three, then to build our solution, we would say that A3 
is four, and so on. So from these solutions, we can build multisets, and from these multisets, we can build the solutions. Since they correspond exactly, the number of multisets must be the same as the number of non-negative integer solutions to this equation. And we already found that that is n plus k minus one choose k, which of course agrees with the theorem. So that's what I think is some very cute combinatorics with multisets. Let me know if you have any questions down in the comments and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math videos on the internet. <coughs> my fate twisting to escape it. Climbing out of my, my, my wrist if you can break it. Breaking in my past, I'm making it up fast. So slow down, give me the time so I can fake it. Race it to move words and just how I say shit. And let me speak my poetry to your face. It's not in the mid if you ain't listening. Not infinite if you ain't really in the